Rice, pasta, bread, and potatoes, all of these are affordable, convenient comfort foods that form the backbone of most people's diets. But there is concern that eating these high-carb foods may cause blood sugar levels to spike. And sending your blood sugar levels on a roller coaster ride all day is almost certainly not ideal for long-term health. In this video, I will discuss six strategies you can use to avoid spikes in blood sugar without reducing your carbohydrate intake. Welcome to the channel, or welcome back. This video is all about blood sugar spikes and how to prevent them. First, let's clarify, what is a blood sugar spike? In the previous video, I suggested that an increase in blood sugar levels to 180 milligrams per deciliter or higher should be considered a blood sugar spike. Ideally, we want to prevent such spikes from happening and keep our blood sugar within the 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter range most of the time, as we have evidence that elevated blood sugar levels and even frequent spikes are associated with negative health consequences. Now, we know from the scientific literature that young, healthy, and lean people with perfect glucose tolerance may never experience such blood sugar spikes, no matter what they eat. But if you have diabetes or prediabetes, you are likely to experience blood sugar spikes frequently. And newer data suggest that even if you're among those who don't have diabetes or prediabetes, Particularly if you're older or overweight, blood sugar may spike in response to some foods. And if you don't know about this and eat these foods regularly, this would almost certainly not be ideal for your health. I don't want to scare you though. The good news is that blood sugar spikes are preventable in most cases, and you don't necessarily have to limit your carbohydrate intake to do that. My intent with this video is to give you the knowledge and the tools that will enable you to keep your average blood sugar levels as low as possible, while also avoiding spikes. So let's get started with a look at my blood sugar levels. At 51, I am certainly in the older age category, and I know that I have a high genetic risk for both obesity and type 2 diabetes. However, my HbA1c is 4.8%, which is equivalent to an average blood sugar of 91 milligrams per deciliter. And that is reflected in data from the continuous glucose monitor I have been wearing for the last two to three months. Unless I'm experimenting wildly for a video like this one here, my blood sugar is between 80 and 140 milligrams per deciliter all of the time, and actually below 120 milligrams per deciliter most of the time. How do I do this? Do I follow a low-carb diet? No, I usually eat plenty of bread, rice, potatoes, fruit, and starchy vegetables. But there are a few key things I pay attention to so that all of those high glycemic index foods don't send my blood sugar on a wild roller coaster ride. Let's take a look at the six evidence-based strategies that help me prevent excessive blood sugar spikes. Strategy number one, minimize foods with a high glycemic index. As we discussed in a prior video, the link is in the description below, the glycemic index is a measure of the blood sugar response to 50 grams of available carbohydrates. What the glycemic index tells us is that the blood sugar response to eating foods with a high glycemic index, such as white rice, cornflakes, white flour, bread, potatoes, soda, or beer, is similar to eating pure sugar. If most of your meals throughout the day consist of high glycemic index foods, you know, for example, cornflakes with milk for breakfast, a sandwich made from white wheat bread for lunch, and white rice or boiled potatoes for dinner, your blood sugar curve throughout the day could very well look like a roller coaster. So staying away from such foods with a high glycemic index of more than about 60 will be a good first step to minimizing blood sugar responses after a meal. Just to give you an example, if you replace the cornflakes with a porridge made from steel cut oats, use sourdough rye bread instead of white wheat bread to make your sandwich for lunch, and say a boiled sweet potato for dinner rather than white rice or white potatoes, you could easily lower your blood sugar levels throughout the day by 20 to 30% without reducing your total carbohydrate intake. I'm not super religious about this though, but whenever I do eat a high glycemic index food, that's when it's particularly important to use one of the other strategies discussed later in this video to prevent blood sugar levels from rising too much. By the way, if you'd like this poster with the glycemic index and glycemic load values of a few common foods, click the link in the description below to find out how you can download it for free. Strategy number two is to eat starchy foods after they have undergone retrogradation. Retrogradation, that's a very big word. 
What it means is this. Starchy foods such as potatoes or rice, when you cook them and eat them right away, almost all of the starch is easily broken down to glucose by our digestive enzymes, and all of the glucose enters our bloodstream quickly. That is why these foods make blood sugar rise so much. However, if you cook rice or potatoes or any other starchy food and then cool them overnight, ideally in a fridge, some of the starch will adopt a different structure. It will become what we call resistant starch. And we call it resistant starch because this starch is now resistant to digestion. Our digestive enzymes cannot break it down and the glucose is kind of trapped within the starch and cannot be taken up into our bloodstream. In other words, some of the highly digestible starch becomes a fiber that stays inside the gastrointestinal tract and will serve as a food for the gut bacteria. That may have some additional benefits, but the main thing we are looking at here is that starchy foods that have undergone this process of retrogradation and therefore have some resistant starch raise blood sugar levels much less than starch that has not undergone retrogradation. The glycemic index of starchy foods that have been cooked and then cooled can easily be 20 to 40% lower than that of the same food eaten you know, right after cooking. With a little bit of planning, this is a strategy you can easily take advantage of. For example, when I cook potatoes, I almost always cook a few extra, keep them in the fridge overnight, and then make potato salad or hash browns the next day. Same with rice, which can nicely be used for a stir fry the next day. Give it a try. Strategy number three, don't eat naked carbs. We call carbs naked if they're eaten without much protein, fat, or fiber. For example, cornflakes with milk, instant oatmeal, white bread with jam, or risotto. Sure, some of these contain a small amount of protein, fat, or fiber, but in all cases, the meal consists almost entirely of easily digestible starch or sugar. There's a rich scientific literature showing clearly that if you add protein to a meal rich in carbs, the blood sugar response is strongly reduced. To a lesser degree, adding some fat or fiber from foods such as vegetables may also help. So what the scientific data suggests is this. If you eat a meal with a high-carb food such as rice, bread, pasta, cornflakes, oatmeal, etc., think about whether you can add a source of protein to the meal. The higher the glycemic index of the food is, the more important it is to add some protein. Meat, fish or shellfish, eggs, Greek yogurt, beans, lentils or tofu would all be good options. Some of these also contain fat, but other sources of fat you could consider adding are nuts and seeds, avocado or olives, or a bit of olive oil. It would also be a good idea to always pair high glycemic index foods with a solid serving of non-starchy vegetables, such as onions, leeks, fennel, celery, leafy greens such as spinach or chard, and cruciferous vegetables, including broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. Your blood sugar response will be lower if you eat the protein, fat, and the fiber-rich vegetables with the high-carb food in one meal. You may have heard the suggestion that protein, fats, and a fiber source should be eaten first and the high-carb food last. It's true that this may lower the blood sugar response even more than eating all the foods together in one meal. Personally, I find this impractical most of the time though, and the additional benefit is probably not huge. Let's take the example high glycemic index breakfast of white bread with jam. Now, my first suggestion would be to eat something different for breakfast entirely, because aside from its high glycemic index, this is not really a nutritious food. But let's ignore that for now. Let's assume you want a lovely Sunday morning breakfast with coffee, the paper, and a nice toast with jam. What you could easily do is add a couple of boiled or scrambled eggs to this meal or replace the white bread with, with, say, you know, whole grain sourdough rye bread with peanut butter or cheese, maybe also with an egg or two. Still a nice Sunday breakfast, and you probably cut your blood sugar response in half with that. Let me show you an example from my own diet. Here I ate a dinner of bread, ham, and cheese. This is one of the biggest increases in blood sugar I've experienced in three months of wearing a continuous glucose monitor. My blood sugar increased to about 170 milligrams per deciliter. Started coming down and then I ate some potato chips and that explains this little additional bump here. Note how this meal isn't even totally naked carbs. The ham and cheese do provide some protein and fat, but because the meal is still mostly carbs from the bread, the blood sugar increase was pretty substantial. Compare this to this time here when I also ate the same bread. Again with ham and cheese and the same amount, four slices of bread. 
but this time I also had two boiled eggs. Barely any increase in my blood sugar here. Another example is this dinner, where we had a traditional German dish of mashed potatoes, sauerkraut and a kind of sm smoked pork. Mashed potatoes have a pretty high glycemic index, but in this complex meal with a good amount of protein, some fat and a large serving of a non-starchy vegetable, my blood sugar response was pretty minimal, topping out at around 120 mg per deciliter. So your key take-home message, don't eat naked carbs, particularly if a typical serving of the food has a glycemic load of 10 or more. See if you can serve it with some protein, fat and a large serving of non-starchy vegetables. Strategy number four, add some vinegar to high carb meals. There's a lot of research showing that having vinegar with or before a high carb meal will pretty substantially lower your blood sugar response. In most of these studies, because it's a research study where we want to standardize what we're testing, the participants had about two tablespoons of vinegar diluted in water a few minutes before eating a high carb meal. Now, is that what I'm recommending here? No, that's not what I'm recommending. Vinegar, even diluted, is a strong acid. I personally don't like it and just wouldn't do this regularly. But even if you like it, drinking an acid like that could have negative effects on your dental health or your mucous membranes in the mouth, the esophagus, or the stomach in the long run. My suggestion is you do what many cultures do. Have a small salad with a vinaigrette before eating a high carb meal or with the meal. Or have some pickles with your sandwich. Make it pleasant, and that way you'll be able to make it into a regular habit. Plus, you'll almost certainly reap some additional benefits from the salad or the pickled vegetables you'll eat with the vinegar. Most research studies used apple cider vinegar, so you could use that, but really any vinegar will do. And it probably doesn't matter too much whether you have the vinegar before the high carb meal or with it. Let me show you an example from my own diet. Here I had leftover mashed potatoes with caramelized onions and sauerkraut for lunch. We didn't have any of the pork left that we had served with this dish the night before, so I had a small salad with vinaigrette before eating the mashed potatoes and the sauerkraut. The blood sugar response was again pretty minimal. There are at least three things going on here that could explain why my blood sugar didn't rise more than 20 mg per deciliter. For one, the salad with the vinegar could have helped but also the sauerkraut that was part of the meal, and the mashed potatoes had been in the fridge overnight, and some of the starch had converted to resistant starch. Remember strategy number two, retrogradation. Strategy number five, use the second meal effect to your advantage. The second meal effect is when whatever we eat for breakfast affects our blood sugar response to our lunch, or when whatever we eat for lunch affects our blood sugar response to our dinner. The most important research finding worth knowing about is that the carbs you eat at one meal actually lower your blood sugar response at the next meal. Let me give you an example. Assume someone eats a specific high carb dinner containing rice and vegetables two days in a row. On the first day he eats a high carb lunch, let's say some salmon and potatoes. On the second day he eats a low carb lunch, let's say a steak with butter and a salad with olive oil. Then the second meal effect would predict that his blood sugar response to the identical dinner would be higher on the day he had the low carb steak lunch. One way to think about this is that if you eat carbs, your body gets ready to handle more carbs. Or vice versa, if you don't eat carbs, even just for one meal, your body tends to have a slightly diminished ability to handle carbs. What this suggests is that if you go low carb, you should eat you know, all of your meals low carb and not switch back and forth between low carb and high carb meals all of the time. There's another aspect to the second meal effect. If one meal is rich in protein or fiber, then this also lowers the blood sugar response at the next meal. So if you eat a high protein, high fiber breakfast, then this will help keep your blood sugar response low at that breakfast and also at the following lunch. Taken together, the second meal effect is another reason why we may want to incorporate a serving of protein and also some source of fiber, such as non-starchy vegetables, into every meal. And try not to eat large portions of high glycemic index foods, such as white rice, potatoes, or baked goods, if the previous meal was low in carbs. Strategy number six, go on a walk after the meal. In my video on the regulation of blood sugar, I talked about the role of the hormone insulin in clearing glucose from the blood after a meal. Remember, when blood sugar levels rise after a meal, it triggers an increase in the hormone insulin. 
Insulin does many things, but in muscle, it binds to the insulin receptor, which then leads to a change inside the cell that causes glucose transporters, called GLUT4, to be transported to the cell membrane. Glucose can then enter the muscle cells from the blood, and blood sugar levels drop. This may not work perfectly in someone who is insulin resistant, though. So here is the good news. Muscle cells can also take up glucose from the blood in a way that is independent of insulin. Imagine if muscle cells could take up sugar from the blood only after a meal and only with the help of insulin. Our species would have long died out because we probably wouldn't have had the time to first unwrap a sandwich and take a bite when that saber-toothed tiger attacked. So in short, muscle cells that are being exercised take up glucose from the blood in a way that is totally independent of insulin. And so it's not surprising that there are a lot of scientific data showing that any muscle contraction after a meal will pretty substantially lower the increase in blood sugar levels. What the data suggests is that exercise should be initiated within about 30 minutes after completing a meal. I guess most people wouldn't want to exercise vigorously after a meal, but even if you just walk around the block for 10 or 15 minutes, that's better than nothing. For larger meals rich in high glycemic index foods, I'd say the longer the better. To show you the impact of walking on blood sugar levels using my own data, I took one for the team. This past Christmas, my mother-in-law baked a special gluten-free cake for me because I have celiac disease. Because a whole cake is not enough in the eyes of mothers and mothers-in-law, she also got several packages of gluten-free Christmas cookies. Again, just for me. Well, I thought this would be a good opportunity for an experiment for this video. In Germany, we do all the gift giving on Christmas Eve, so I knew I'd be sitting around for hours while we were unwrapping gifts. So right before the gift giving started, when coffee, cake and cookies were served, I had four slices of the cake and about 20 cookies. I basically munched cake and cookies for about an hour. But hey, don't judge, I did it only for your benefit. Unfortunately, I couldn't include the footage of the actual cake and cookie eating in this video as graphic imagery of self-harm is not permitted on YouTube. However, I have evidence of what happened to my blood sugar levels. Predictably, a perfect example of a blood sugar spike, all the way up to 190 mg per deciliter. It's actually a little bit insane to eat this much refined flour and sugar in a single sitting. So let me reiterate that I do not recommend eating this way regularly. But for you guys, I did it again the next day. Except now I had a hard boiled egg a few minutes before I started the cake and cookies feast and then went on a 60 minute walk right afterwards. Have a guess at what my blood sugar levels looked like. Well, there is still an increase to about 140 mg per deciliter. But that increase is 50 mg per deciliter less pronounced than the day before. 50 mg per deciliter less. From having a pretty substantial blood sugar spike, my sugar remained in the normal homeostatic range between 70 and 140 mg per deciliter, even with this huge amount of cake and cookies. Okay, so this was not just a walk, but also some added protein from the egg. So let me show you what just a walk does. Here we were traveling back from a trip, which included a four hour car ride. During the drive, I ate some bread and some potato chips. I know for sure that I wasn't moving the entire time because I was driving the car. So as a result, my blood sugar went all the way to 170 mg per deciliter. So obviously, the mistake I made there was that I should not have eaten something with such a high glycemic index when I knew I couldn't move for four hours afterwards. But at least I wanted to you know, make use of these data. And so I recreated this meal a little bit later. Again, I had the same bread and the same potato chips, but then went on a walk right afterwards. So this here at 1.50 p.m. is when the meal started. When do you think did I stop walking? Yes, exactly at 2.45 p.m. I arrived back home and sat down in the office again. And with such a large meal, there was apparently still a lot of glucose entering the blood and my blood sugar still increased to about 150 milligrams per deciliter. Certainly better than before, but in this case, it would probably have been better to walk for another half hour or so. In summary, even without reducing our overall consumption of carbohydrates, we can avoid blood sugar spikes by using one or several of these six strategies. Strategy number one, minimize foods with a high glycemic index. 
If you have a food with a glycemic index of 60 or more, use one of the other strategies to lower its impact on your blood sugar levels. Strategy number two, eat starchy foods after they have undergone retrogradation, that is cooling in the fridge. Strategy number three, don't eat naked carbs. Have some protein and ideally some fat and non-starchy vegetables with a high carb meal or as an appetizer or first course prior to the high carb meal. Strategy number four, add some vinegar to high carb meals, for example, in the form of a small salad with vinaigrette prior to the main course. Strategy number five, Use the second meal effect to your advantage. So if you're planning a big high carb dinner, make sure to have some carbs and maybe also some protein and fiber with lunch. And mostly make sure to not constantly switch back and forth between low carb and high carb meals. And strategy number six, go on a walk after a meal. I invite you to experiment with these strategies. To make it easier to remember these strategies, I have summarized them on a poster that you can download for free. The link is in the description below. Let's wrap up this video with a brief discussion of the root cause of blood sugar spikes, glucose intolerance. First, if the term glucose intolerance is foreign to you, please check out my video about the regulation of blood sugar. The link is in the description below. Now, all of the strategies we discussed in this video are based on scientific evidence and they all work to lower the blood sugar response to eating carbohydrates. But these strategies alone may not be sufficient to bring your blood sugar levels into the normal range. If you experience frequent blood sugar spikes, it is likely that you are glucose intolerant to some degree at least. To totally normalize your blood sugar levels, you would need to also improve your glucose tolerance. For example, if you currently have diabetes with an HbA1c of 7.5, that means your average blood sugar level is about 170 mg per deciliter. Your fasting blood sugar may be 130 mg per deciliter, and if you don't use any of the strategies we discussed in this video, meaning you eat naked high glycemic index carbs with every meal, you don't go on walks, you never eat any salad or vegetables, etc., your blood sugar will likely shoot up to over 200 mg per deciliter after every meal. Then you discover this video and you start to eat more low glycemic index foods and you eat them with some protein and a large plate of non-starchy vegetables. You always have a small salad with vinaigrette before big meals or go on a walk after a meal. With these changes, you can almost certainly avoid these spikes and your HbA1c may come down to say 7%. That's better than before, much better. But your blood sugar levels are still too high and you still have diabetes. To lower your blood sugar levels more, ideally into the non-diabetic range, you would need to improve your glucose tolerance, that is, your body's intrinsic ability to keep blood sugar in a normal range. Discussing what causes glucose intolerance and how to reverse it is well beyond the scope of this video though. I just wanted to be very clear that we can tackle elevated blood sugar levels in a variety of ways, and it's my goal to introduce you to all of these. Rest assured that this video here is just the beginning and just the first set of tools in you know, our tool belt, so to speak. I have numerous videos planned about the causes of glucose intolerance and interventions known to reverse glucose intolerance, as well as the different dietary approaches to prevent or treat diabetes. So please make sure to subscribe to the channel if this is of interest to you. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. If this video was helpful to you, please press the like button down there and share the video with any friends or family members you think may be interested in this. Or post a link to the video on your social media profile. Elevated blood sugars are a major contributor to many chronic diseases, and in many cases totally preventable or treatable by dietary and lifestyle change. And it's one of my primary goals with this channel, to help people get high quality, evidence-based information so that they can take action themselves. I'd be very grateful if you help me spread the word. As always, you can find a more detailed discussion in the blog post associated with this video, along with all the references. Until next time, bye-bye.